Hello, this is the 10th episode of Gospel Open Data Science. I'm your host, Mark G. Bilby. Um, if you have caught it, Jack has uh, Jack Bull, our, my co-host, has given a introduction to a relaunch that we are doing, Jack, Marcus Vincent, and I, of uh, content on the channel. This last weekend, we recorded about three hours worth of uh, Q&A in depth about Marcus's reconstruction of the Apostolos, which is Marcian's collection of Paul's letters, which is now with the publisher. And Jack and I decided that we're going to sort of um, split out the programming where some of it is focused on Marcion and uh, early church fathers and might have guests and such. And then Wednesday sessions will be reserved for my work on data science and uh, my reconstruction of Marcion's gospel and the sources of Marcion's gospel and its later um, recipients. So today I'm going to look uh, particularly at one passage. I, I opened it up to some of my patrons on Patreon to um, suggest passages. And one of my most uh, ardent supporters uh, just recommended I go with a passage I thought uh, would be enjoyable and that would exemplify um, some of the method that I've, I've worked out in this uh, tracing of signals um, across the Gospels. So um, let me go ahead and open that. Um, and please uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, we're up to 617 subscribers. I think we'll get a lot more as so we have a lot of uh, a lot more content about to roll out. Um, I've just uploaded to Zenodo, which is an open science repository based out of Europe, uh, a new version of my uh, major book on Marcin's Gospel, which I call a Laudlib Linked Open Data Living Informational Book. So you can find version 4.05 there and um it's not the entirety of the book i've split it out now into five different volumes so the most the two most recent uploads only include volume two which is the synopsis so if you want to see the content in volumes one three four five uh you'll need to go back to version 4.04 or 4.03 one of those versions where you can see the proofs for instance and extensive tables and some data visualizations and, and different kinds of things. Um, you know, as the project has evolved, I've uh, submitted portions of the book to journals and they've been peer reviewed and published through journals. And then some of it is just so extensive and so complex that it doesn't really fit into any traditional scholarly monograph series or any traditional journal publishing. Um, it's what I, what I would consider to be a virtual research environment where it's uh, it's open science, it's um, you know uh, more more content and more complex content that can fit in a traditional book page. So um, today we'll be focusing in on a passage I think is is particularly interesting. Um, in a previous episode, I had looked at the temptation of Jesus, a small version of it in the Gospel according to Mark, significantly longer version of it in the gospel according to Matthew, significantly longer version in the gospel according to Luke. And I mentioned that with Marcion's gospel, that text isn't there. There is no temptation, and that's attested by various church fathers. And that's actually a really helpful indication of what is not in Q. So traditional ideas of Q are that the temptation was there. Marcion's gospel lacks it. Uh, and because Marcion's gospel, if you look really carefully at the patterns throughout it, you can see that it's using two sources, uh, a, a source that aligns very closely in style and content and sequence with Mark, and then a, another gospel that looks quite similar to what scholars have traditionally reconstructed for Q as a succession of ethical teachings of Jesus focused on the poor and on the liberation of slaves. Um, and the depiction of Jesus as an Aesop-like figure. Um, so this passage that we'll be looking at today about the death of John the Baptist, um, it is not in Marcion's Gospel. Uh, Marcion's Gospel does mention John being thrown into prison, but it doesn't have any detailed narrative about the death of John. Um, Tertullian expresses surprise, uh, you know, or astonishment or bewilderment in his commentary on Marcin's Gospel that John appears so late, what we would consider to be chapter seven of, of Luke, where John is asking whether Jesus is the Christ or not. Um, that's the first instance in Marcin's Gospel of a mention of John the Baptist. So you could say John the Baptist is there. He's, he's not portrayed necessarily as a negative figure uh, in Marcin's text. 
Um, certainly later people and scholars, some scholars have argued that, but there's not anything necessarily that's, in fact, Jesus speaks in a, a laudatory way of John as the greatest um, of those born of women, uh, but may see a differentiation in terms of John as reflecting a prior era of the prophets and Jesus is reflecting a new era or moment or age of, of history. Uh, but anyways, Marcin's gospel doesn't have any any story about the death of John the Baptist. And I think this is a great point where we can see that um, the later the stratum, uh, the more involved the story is. Uh, traditional you know, scholars traditionally, uh, because they're, they are, uh, I would say, prejudiced that these texts were created by single authors, which they, whether they are making a historical claim or not, uh, by calling these authors Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they fall into the habit of foisting a hagiographical framework on all of these texts. So the idea is, you know, a, a very variety of scholars, even quite, you know, methodologically, might, what might be considered liberal scholars, will assume that Luke was written in one go, or Mark was written in one go, or Matthew was written in one go, and that they were all written by one person. And these people essentially just don't know how to do data modeling. That's essentially what it boils down to by starting with those hagiographical concepts and pr the presumption, which is unfounded of a single author and a single voice in these texts. Even if you might have more than one source, the presumption is still a single voice. And that simply doesn't hold up under careful analysis of these texts. All of these texts have multiple strata, not just John, which many scholars would say, but Mark has multiple strata, at least two, likely three. Matthew has at least two highly distinctive strata. And Luke clearly and actually scientifically has two distinct strata, which you can see in comparing Marcion's text with canonical Luke. There is simply a different voice that uh, is present and overarching and doing the edit editing or redaction of canonical Luke. So by splitting Luke, you can start to get a handle on how to split the other gospels correctly, how to split Matthew into its two major strata or redactions in history, how to split Mark into its two or three redactions, and even how to split John into its two or three redactions. But this would align with other uh, pre, you know, prior scholarly depictions of uh, the gospel according to John. So if we, if we model the data flows correctly, which I've done here uh, really for the first time in history, um, because I'm strictly looking at this as data and trying to map data flows and not using hagiography notions of saints writing these texts as the grounded grounding or framework for doing this. You can see that the, the data flow, it, it's pretty clearly expanding or cascading over time. Uh, where in Marcion's gospel, which I call Luke 1, LK1, Proto Luke, uh, there's no story of John's death. There's simply no interest in any kind of narrative about how John died. Um, there is a, a bit, very basic mention of John going to prison in the first stratum of the gospel according to John, which I would put around the early 100s. Uh, it's very Dionysian, as Dennis McDonald has talked about, this particular stratum. Um, but as I mentioned before, Marcion's gospel does have John being in prison and then sending an inquiry to Jesus, but there's no clear mention of the death of John the Baptist. So uh, the early stratum of John is basically what is closest to Marcion's gospel, um, which again, I think was probably written in the 80s, uh, not long after the Jewish war, um, but you know, before other, other kinds of events, before Pliny uh, started uh, killing people called Christianoi or Messianics. If you look at Luke, uh, it's the second most developed of these stories um, within this continuum. Um, it mentions Herod. Uh, it mentions uh, a reason for um, Herod killing John the Baptist and locking him up in prison, as it says. Um, it actually doesn't specifically mention the death of John the Baptist in this context. So you could say it's it's a fairly simple narrative. Herod is uh, described as a tetrarch. We find this prior in Luke um, 3, 1, uh, the word tetrarch being applied to Herod as well as other rulers of the time. Luke has a tendency, as many scholars have talked about before, of conflating Herod into sort of a single evil character. It's kind of a conflation or a caricature of Herod. And, um, and then a motivation tied to Herodian. So, 
canonical Luke is reflecting some knowledge of Josephus, but uh, not going far beyond what Josephus says. Josephus mentions John the Baptist, mentions John the Baptist being put in prison, mentions him being killed, but he doesn't mention the the way the manner by which he was killed, specifically the, the beheading. There's no mention of the, the beheading of John the Baptist in Josephus' antiquity. So you could say Luke is um, sort of the most simple narrative about the death of John the Baptist, canonical Luke. Matthew expands it. And you, you can see this in very specific ways of uh, expanding, just adding new verbs, adding new concepts. And if you just picture each one of these things in your mind, it's easier to see this. So, you know, in Luke, there's no, for instance, direct speech. John never speaks directly to Herod. He is re re reproved by him, but it's indirect speech. It's not direct speech. In Matthew, we get direct speech. John actually speaks directly to Herod. And in Mark, John speaks directly to Herod as well, using the same words that are in Matthew, but expanding it. Uh, you can also find things like, you know, jo uh, Herod locked John up in prison. It mentions reproving, but Matthew expands it by adding this laying hold or essentially arresting, arresting, binding him and putting him in prison. So there's just more layers. There's more, there's more verbs. There's more mental images. Um, and then when you get to Mark, it's not only that Herod has John uh, arrested, uh, he's doing so through proxies. So there's a very clear reference apostelas um, in this, uh, the, the participle basically puts an emphasis on the fact that Herod himself was responsible, but that he enacted this through proxies. And we find that emphasis on proxies um, throughout canonical Luke. Um, I would even speculate that this these portions of Matthew and, and Mark may have been redacted by the redactor of canonical Luke, because we see a lot of interesting overlaps between stylistic stylistically distinctive elements of canonical Luke that are actually quite consistently reflected here in canonical Matthew and canonical Mark, including, for instance, the use of proxies, particularly by rulers to carry out um, specific tasks. We have um, a, a, a further elaboration of the motivation for Herod killing John the Baptist, basically an explanation tagged on to the story. So, you know, again, traditional narrative is Mark was written first and, and then somehow John just greatly simplified Mark and Matthew somewhat simplified Mark and Luke restated and simplified Mark. It, it just doesn't make much sense if you're thinking, uh, I would say, if you're, if you're just simply mo doing data flow modeling and you don't start with the assumption that Mark was written in a single go by one person early, if you don't start with that prejudicial, really a priori uh, unfounded assumption, this is clearly, Mark is clearly the most involved, the most elaborate, elaborate text. And um, usually you now the, the kind of big fish stories, uh, the more involved, the more detail, the more expanded, um, the later the story is. So it, it makes a heck of a lot of sense here to say that Mark is based on Matthew and Luke. It doesn't make much sense to say that Luke is based on Mark. It doesn't make much sense to say Matthew is based on Mark, but just happen to leave aside certain things, certain explanations, chop down the speech act of, of John to Herod, these sorts of things. It makes much more sense to model the data in this way. And then if we scroll down to the next part of the story, which involves Herodias, the... Uh, the daughter of, um, of um, well, Herodias being the wife of uh, Philip that Herod married, and then the daughter of Herodias dancing. We get basically an elaborate court tale or court fable. Um, it's the kind of thing that we find in Daniel, um, where we're just we're witnessing a court intrigue. Where you know there's a feast, there's a festival occasion. Um, but we have just a lot going on here. We have um, Herod, uh, motivation in, in uh, Matthew. Herod all of a sudden has motivation to kill John and yet conflicting emotions. He's afraid of John because they held him to be a prophet. By the way, I'm, I'm doing fresh translations of all of these things. And the translations are somewhat wooden and that's intentional uh, because I want it to stick as close as possible to the syntax and 
uh, the word order of uh, underlying Greek text. So um, with all of these, I've now completed through chapter three, which is up, up, uploaded to Zenodo. I have parallel English translations to accompany the Greek, as well as these little, little signal labels. So if it says MK3C, that's a clear signal from the third stratum of Mark, which essentially here is a, a signal that we don't find in Matthew or other other gospels so the idea that um that there was somebody who wished to kill jesus that's consistent between the two but the motive is actually where in matthew it's uh, attributed to herod he's the one with the motive to kill john the baptist in uh mark it gets deferred or um basically pinned on a woman so a woman is to blame kind of a, a Jimmy Buffett moment, but in reverse, where the uh, as the later the stratum, the more women are demonized in these texts. The more uh, sort of proto-orthodoxy takes hold in these texts, the more patriarchal it becomes. So where Herod's a bad guy in Matthew, Herodias, it's really a woman who's to blame for the death of John the Baptist and Mark. Again, that doesn't make much sense if Mark is written first, then like you know, the, then the, the woman is not the one responsible when it comes to Matthew, he blames the guy instead. And then in Luke, there's no motive or there is a motive, but there's just no clear elaboration. There's no court tale, all these kinds of things. So this far more extensive story, which is not in Luke, this is very likely a late story, a mid second century story about um, Jesus and John the Baptist. It likely has no historical value whatsoever. Um, it's not anchored at all in the historical account that Josephus gives of John um, being an insurrectionist essentially and killed for being an insurrectionist. It may lift up John though as royalty or as a, a serious political threat because um, de decapitation in Roman society at that time was often reserved for the royals or uh, you know members of the Senate or what have you. So Cicero famously was, was beheaded um, at that time. So maybe Maybe there's an implicit depiction of John as sort of a new Cicero, um, a, an ethical, a popular ethical and moral teacher um, to the people, something of a philosopher. Uh, so this this goes together, I think, very much with the depiction of Jesus as a philosopher, the depiction of Paul as a philosopher in Acts and the canonical Luke in Acts, um, and then the second stratum of John also depicting Jesus as a new Socrates. Basically, these mid second century strata in the gospels uh, have a concerted which is around the time of justin martyr who really is the first to talk about christianity as a philosophy right not as a, a cult not as a just a ritual system but as a philosophy as something that would be recognized in the greco-roman world as a philosophical movement and school concurrent with that with justin martyr essentially you have these elaborate attempts to depict D jesus paul john the baptist and other figures as as if they were had been philosophers or sophists pu famous public rhetors or speakers um who and you know in this case needed to be killed so we have uh, a lot of elaboration here uh, you know all this stuff in matthew again not in luke so we have a court tale a setting that it was herod's birthday we have herodias um uh, the daughter of herodias dancing we have Her herod making an oath a rash oath that's that's a theme that comes up in in Greek and Roman literature, but it's also known in the Septuagint um, from Jephthah, for instance, uh, making a rash oath or Samson. So this is a sign of a, a foolish ruler who, who makes an oath and um, it's one that he has trouble keeping, um, makes promises essentially that he can't keep. And um, then there's sort of a seduction here that happens and uh, Herod uh, is sort of coerced, you might say, into though something he probably wanted to do, but it gives him an excuse to do do this thing that he already wanted to do, but maybe didn't have the initiative or w wouldn't take the initiative to do to have John the Baptist killed. And then there's even something like bodily devotion to the corpse of John the Baptist. Again, not an emphasis at all in canonical Luke, not an emphasis at all in uh, gospel according to John, certainly not an emphasis in Marcion's gospel. This is, again, probably a later development, mid-second century development, where there's a concern with something like an emerging kind of cult of the saints around early Christian, Christian legendary figures, um, including John the Baptist as he's held up as, as sort of this legendary um, 
you know, elaborate martyr. One might also think of the story of Judith in the um, in the Septuagint uh, because it involves the beheading of a man, but in, in this case, Holofernes, but in this case, the roles would be reversed where, you know, instead of a Jewish heroine beheading the Babylonian general and, you know, putting his head on a pike and scaring the Babylonians or the Assyrians, it kind of is mixing them up in the story of Judith. Um, here it's a woman requesting the head on a plate and then it is, it is, uh, it is given. There are proxies. Herod does act through proxies. He's called, he's called the king. This fits royal court tales. Um, again, that tend to be highly fictional stories that we have in Esther and Daniel, for instance, short stories. Uh, we have lots of different court tales between the second century BC and, and first and second century CE. Um, and then, but we just get a lot more detail in Mark. And again, it doesn't make a lot of sense that Matthew, if it's based on Mark, would just remove a lot of these really well integrated bits, like that it's Herodias rather than Herod, who was the one who was really preoccupied with John the Baptist. She, it's her motive that is responsible. Um, she is not able. It's it's in the, it's a third person verb. It could be masculine or feminine, but pretty clearly in in Mark here, it's that she was not able to kill him. Um, there's a depiction of, of uh, John the Baptist as righteous. That might echo uh, bits of Josephus in his depiction of John the Baptist. So again, that points probably to a setting after the antiquities of Josephus for the writing of this portion of Mark's gospel, where earlier stuff doesn't seem much dependent on Josephus, the bits in Mark that are dependent on the antiquities probably favor, uh, you know, early, but more likely a mid second century date. Um, we have days of celebration, uh, not just the birthday festivities. Uh, we have the mention of neighbors. Um, I think well, it looks like that's, I'm not sure why I underlined it. Cause I tried just to underline stuff that, Oh, Oh, okay. Well, maybe it's, maybe I just need to search. Okay, I'm not seeing neighbor come up there, so maybe that's just an incorrect underline. Need to fix that. Oh, it probably should be relatives, actually. Guess anyways. Yep. Okay. Well, I'll fix that. I make mistakes sometimes in my translation. And I need to fix them. So he's with his relatives, but then also we have additional guests. Uh, quite an elaboration in... Um, in Mark, where it's it's not just relatives, but the great men um, who are sort of underneath him, the Kiliarchs or uh, the commanders of a thousand. Uh, these that's a traditional title for um, members of the tribunal class in Roman society. Um, so you know, like again, hagiographical legend would say Mark was written in Rome in seventy, and that's why it has these Latinisms. But much more likely is canonical mark was written in the mid second century and just goes through these elaborate you know elaborate extensions of the story that was prior to it where herod has has guests and um you know there's an elaborate list of of these people and then likely including them as dependents actually which is on a cano um which could mean people who recline that's usually how it's translated in most english translation but it's also a technical term for people who are dependents of a, a royal person, basically, um, you know, a Herod would be the patron, uh, sort of the political and royal patron of um, these underlings um, who are, you know, upper class in the society at the time. So that whole elaboration doesn't make much sense that Luke just entirely omits all this intrigue and court drama, which is very typical for Luke to, you know, throughout that gospel. That Matthew downsizes it and just like removes all the different elaborations of people from the guest list. Um, we even have uh, Herod giving an oath, but in Mark we have Herod giving an oath with direct speech. And again, we see the same sort of tendency or trajectory where like the early versions of stories, you know, simply state that something happened. Um, and may infer that there was some kind of speech, but they don't actually elaborate what the speech was. The later the stratum, the more vivid and elaborate the speech acts are, um, the more sort of 
historicizing fiction writing is happening uh, to, to give characters motivation in this case to shift motivation or uh, in this case also to uh, give extended speech acts. Um, so early, you know, Marcion's gospel, for instance, doesn't really has Herod saying a minimal amount during the trial of Jesus has Pilate speaking minimally during the trial of Jesus. But in all the canonical gospels, there's much more elaborate speech going on at the trial of Jesus um, by royal officials, by bystanders, by followers of Jesus, by Jesus himself. Right. So elaborate speech acts. Uh, especially if you have a story where you have no speech act or just an implicit speech act, uh, when you have extensive speech acts given, it's probably a good indication that you're looking at a later stratum within that text. We even have dialogue. We have um, an exitus and reditus here in Mark, which is very typical of canonical Luke, that the daughter of Herodias leaves the room, apparently, because only the men are in the room, I guess. Right. This also goes together in Canonical Mark. We see a lot of vivid description of, of household settings, of courts, of rooms, and of people entering and exiting rooms, people entering and exiting through roofs. Again, all of that architectural detail and all that staging, you might say, that's absent from Marcion's Gospel. Again, early Gospels weren't really so interested about depicting all of the dramatic detail, the costuming, gestures movement of characters, motivations of characters, dramatic soliloquies. Marcin's gospel largely doesn't have those things because it's just not interested in sort of a, a literary fictional um, it, it, you know, retelling of these stories. So um, even this mention of haste, that's very typical of canonical Luke. This is one of my, the reasons that I would think that this chunk of Mark actually might have been redacted by the editor of canonical Luke, because there are just a lot of what we might consider typically Lucan features that are, aren't actually in Luke at all. Um, chronological references, reference to speed or haste, extended dialogue. Um, that is a little correction that needs to be made here. Motivation that Herod's full of grief. He's conflicted. You might say so. It's more of a, an interest with what politicians are are thinking or doing, sort of a humanizing of them, um, and uh, and then also sort of the political system of which they're a part, um, and then uh, a, a focus on honor and shame as being a concern of the royals. Uh, we also have additional characters in Mark, like an executioner. So no mention of executioner in Matthew. So again, like. Matthew depended on Mark, but just removed the executioner, removed Herod's feelings, removed the mention of haste, removed the entrance and exit of the daughter of Herodias. It doesn't make any sense that Matthew, in this case, downsizes or abridges, because this is not an abridgment. What you see in, Mark, in Matthew is not an abridgment of Mark. It's a different story. It's a simpler story. It's a story with fewer characters. It's a story with less or implicit dialogue it's a story with less or implicit emotion if 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 it exists at all um so you know abridgers don't take out characters abridgers don't remove emotion right abridgers just state portions of the story abridgers don't downsize or remove the guest list it, it just doesn't make any sense mark in this case is a mid-second this is a mid-second century account that we find in Mark's gospel. And then the demonizing of women. This again goes together with traditional Greco-Roman stories. It goes together with the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey of, you know, woman Helen being the one responsible for conflict or, um, you know, political intrigue being centered on a, a female figure, um, the veneration of the body. Again, even small little details. So, you know, Matt, Matt, Mark was written first and in Mark's gospel and, and Mark, um, the disciples of John the Baptist hear about the story, uh, hear about John the Baptist being killed, and then they go and take his corpse, honor it by placing it in a tomb. Well, in, in Matthew, they don't hear. So why would Matthew remove, why would the author of that stratum in Matthew remove, um, you know, just that little incidental detail about, you know, hearing. Well, that, this goes together with that traditional emphasis that we see in canonical Luke, especially about hearing and seeing, 
uh, sort of, you know, visual or auditory uh, participles being what explains how an action happened, uh, sort of a perspectival view where the character you see through the lens of the characters, um, or, you know, there's, there's a continuity or seamlessness in the action where things don't just happen. It's that they happen in a proper sort of sequence that's causal. So, you know, it's not just that John the Baptist is killed gap there. We might say there's a filling of the gap and that we find this all over the place in the Hebrew Bible, uh, where, you know, one version of a story of David, for instance, doesn't have certain details. There's an implicit gap like, well, how did, you know, how did John the Baptist followers find out about his killing? Well, they heard about it. So some report came to them. That's a gap that is filled in by canonical Mark. No, no reason. It doesn't make much sense that Matthew takes out that little detail that fills a gap that essentially was left there in the story of canonical Matthew. So again, the, pro the, the pattern we see through, throughout these texts, if we actually are interested in modeling data flow, is to look at the expansion of stories, the addition of characters, motivation for characters, additional and expansive vocabulary, especially if it shows sort of more intellectual sophistication or political connection. Uh, there's a there's an elevation in status and socioeconomic status when we look across this. There's a matching of conventions we find in Greco-Roman drama, for instance, with haste. Um, you know, the if, if servants or underlings in Greco-Roman drama move with haste, that's a, just a common trope. So there's just there's just a much more elaborate detail that, that doesn't make sense for the earliest account, right? So the earliest account gives all this elaborate detail, all this dramatic detail, and then it gets progressively or completely removed by the later texts, by canonical Luke and canonical Matthew. Those folks basically who think that way just have it completely backwards and upside down. And it's because they're starting with largely because they're starting with the prejudicial understanding that Marcion's gospel is late and that it's an abridgment. If you just understand Marcion's gospel probably contains reflections of most of our early earliest traditions um, that we find in gospel and gospel-like texts, then it's pretty clear that these chunks of Matthew and Mark often, which are not in Marcion's gospel and some of which are not even in canonical Luke, are uh, mid second century redactions. So that's that for, for today. I can go into more detail, but um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm doing English translations now for all these things. So, you know, I, I started doing, I did a lot of the Greek, trend, uh, Greek textual mapping or signals mapping going back three and four years. So this has been out here for scholars to look at. And, you know, if scholars don't want to look at it, but, you know, I guess that's up to them. But I think this is pretty, significant in terms of a legitimate, scientifically legitimate modeling of data flows um, for the first time across these texts. So it's out there and it'd be interesting to, you know, engage other scholars in a conversation about whether this is viable. But if it makes sense to you, if you think this is legitimate, then, you know, read more about it, but ask your teachers, ask your professors, is, is Bill B on the right track? Is he onto something here? with this signal tracing method, triangulating signals across the gospels, looking for direct and uh, bypassed and then synthesized uh, traditions. So in, in canonical Matthew here, we find a uh, clear synthesis of, I'm sorry, in canonical Mark here, we find clear synthesis of elements from Matthew and Luke. Um, so much makes much more sense that Mark here is latest because it's the most synthesized. It's the most synthetic. It combines elements that are in Luke and in Matthew. It takes elements in Matthew that sound like they probably come from Luke, but then get expanded and then appear in the Matthean form in Mark. Um, but again, the overall trajectory, if, if you just took the names away, if you took Luke, Mark, and Matthew away, and you just looked at these words as data, most people I think would come to the conclusion that if, if the data is missing entirely, it's probably an early reflection. If it's very simple data, it's probably earlier in history. If it's a little more complex, probably next. If it's even more complex, probably next. And if it's the most complex, the most synthesized, especially if it's picking up elements from 
two prior strata that are distinctive and then fusing them together, which is what I've shown here, right? You have elements that are you find in, in Luke and then elements that you find in Matthew and then they're they're combined um, in this in this text. So uh, yep, that'll that'll do it for the day. Uh, if you have um, questions or thoughts or suggestions about future passages that I should focus in on, um, you're welcome to do that. As I mentioned, I finished the translating of uh, the first three chapters into English, but quite a bit more actually. There's a lot of chapters four, five, and six that I've translated now into English in these parallel kind of passages. So I hope this makes the translations make it a lot more useful to a much broader audience and, um, you know, just get a broader public uh, really thinking about this and, and engaging with this work. All right. Thank you very much for your time and, and interest, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.